pardon, but am I interrupting? No, not at all. This is Brad's brother. In the early 1930s, Warner Brothers set out to create a new musical film, which would later become the beloved Gold Diggers of 1933. The casting process for this classic was a fascinating journey filled with auditions, chemistry tests, and pivotal moments. For the role of Brad Roberts, a wealthy composer who falls for a showgirl, the studio initially considered actor Dick Powell. However, they found his singing voice more suitable for the part, and decided to cast him in the lead role. This decision would ultimately launch Powell's successful career in musical films. To play the cunning and ambitious showgirl, Polly, Warner Brothers turned to actress Ruby Keeler. Known for her dancing skills, Keeler had already made a name for herself on Broadway. The studio saw her potential and offered her the part, marking her film debut and solidifying her status as a rising star. The character of Carol, another showgirl vying for Brad's affections, was given to actress Joan Blondell. Blondell's experience in various Warner Brothers pictures made her a natural fit for the role. Her quick wit and comedic timing added depth to the character and contributed to the film's overall success. A key aspect of the casting process was finding the right actors to play the supporting roles. Ginger Rogers, already an established name in Hollywood, was cast as Faye, a gold-digging showgirl. Her charisma and on-screen presence added a touch of glamour to the film. Ned Sparks, a well-known character actor, was chosen to play the role of Barney. The show's producer, Sparks' deadpan delivery and sarcastic humor provided a perfect contrast to the film's musical numbers and added a layer of complexity to the storyline. As the filming progressed, the cast chemistry became evident, with each actor bringing their unique talents to the production. The pivotal moments during the auditions and rehearsals showcased the ensemble's ability to work together, ultimately resulting in a successful and entertaining film. In the end, the casting of Gold Diggers of 1933 proved to be an essential element in the movie's success. Each actor's individual talents and collective chemistry contributed to the film's enduring legacy as a classic Hollywood musical. Uh, that's great. I like it. Have you got anything else? Yes, I have a couple of things. Well, play them, play them. Mervyn Leroy, the director behind Gold Diggers of 1933, was known for his innovative and dynamic approach to filmmaking. He brought the story to life through a combination of snappy dialogue, memorable musical numbers, and stunning visuals. Leroy drew inspiration from various sources, including vaudeville acts and contemporary social issues. His signature style involved blending comedy and drama seamlessly, often incorporating elements of satire to critique societal norms. Collaboration played a crucial role in shaping the final product. Leroy worked closely with choreographer Busby Berkeley, who designed the elaborate dance sequences featuring precise formations and unique camera angles. Together, they created unforgettable performances like We're in the Money and Pettin in the Park. Leroy also fostered strong relationships with his cast members, encouraging them to contribute ideas and improvisations during rehearsals. For instance, Joan Blondell, one of the lead actresses, frequently suggested lines that made it into the final script due to her comedic timing and quick wit. This collaborative spirit resulted in a more cohesive and engaging narrative that resonates even today. Moreover, art directors Anton Grot and Chester Lyons contributed significantly by designing visually striking sets that added depth and texture to each scene. Their work ranged from constructing lavish ballrooms to creating gritty tenement apartments, effectively immersing viewers in the contrasting worlds inhabited by the characters. Overall, Leroy's directorial vision for Gold Diggers of 1933 relied heavily on collaboration, innovation, and adaptability. By drawing upon diverse creative influences and nurturing talent around him, he crafted a timeless piece of cinema that continues to entertain audiences eight decades later. Oh, why, you're the very personification of you. Oh, thanks, but honest, I don't know what's the matter with me. Gold Diggers of 1933 is a classic movie that has stood the test of time. Many fascinating facts surround its production and release. For instance, did you know that the famous song We're in the Money was almost cut from the film due to its controversial nature? This movie holds a special place in my heart because it introduced me to the golden age of Hollywood musicals. The first time I watched it, I was amazed by the elaborate dance numbers and catchy tunes. I remember feeling transported to another era where glitz and glamour were everything. Perhaps you have your own memorable experiences associated with this film. We'd love to hear them. Share your favorite moment or personal connection to Gold Diggers of 1933 in the comments below.
Now, let's dive into some surprising stories behind this iconic film. From financial struggles during production to last-minute changes, there's much more to discover about Gold Diggers of 1933. Stay tuned for some laughs, gasps, and maybe even tears as we explore the intriguing tale of this beloved classic. When I get the money. Get the money? Money? It's always the way. In the early 1930s, the film industry was grappling with the transition from silent movies to talkies. Gold Diggers of 1933 was one such musical film that embraced this change, showcasing cutting-edge technology and techniques. The set design for this classic was a marvel in itself. The movie was primarily shot on elaborate sound stages in Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, California. The artificial sets, including the lavish apartments and Broadway theaters, were meticulously crafted to create a vivid and believable backdrop. One of the most innovative aspects of the film was its use of three-strip Technicolor for the Swearers and Threat. The Gold Diggers song number? This was an early instance of widescreen filming, which added depth and richness to the scene. However, filming was not without its challenges. Synchronizing sound and image was a significant hurdle, as microphones had to be hidden to avoid appearing on camera. Moreover, the actors had to wear body microphones, which often malfunctioned, leading to retakes. The movie also faced logistical challenges due to its large cast and crew. Coordinating schedules and ensuring everyone was on the same page was a daunting task. Yet, the final product was worth the effort, as the film became a box office hit and a critical success. In addition, Gold Diggers of 1933 is remembered for its catchy musical numbers and snappy dialogues. The film's innovative use of technology and design elements contributed significantly to its popularity and enduring legacy in Hollywood's golden age. True love, real love, with a real woman. The movie Gold Diggers of 1933 is a classic example of a musical comedy that has stood the test of time. Released during the Great Depression, it tells the story of four chorus girls who try to find wealthy husbands. Directed by Mervyn Leroy, the film features an ensemble cast including Warren William, Joan Blondell, Aline McMahon, and Ruby Keeler. The movie is also known for its catchy musical numbers, such as We're in the Money and Pettin' in the Park, which were composed by Harry Warren and Al Dubin. The film's release was not without controversy, as it was initially banned in several states due to its perceived immorality. However, the film's popularity eventually led to its widespread release and critical acclaim. The movie's success can be attributed to its talented cast and crew, as well as its ability to tap into the zeitgeist of the time. The Great Depression had left many Americans feeling disillusioned and cynical, and the film's satirical take on wealth and marriage struck a chord with audiences. Despite its age, Gold Diggers of 1933 remains a beloved classic, thanks in part to its memorable musical numbers and sharp wit. Its themes of love, ambition, and the pursuit of wealth continue to resonate with audiences today, making it a timeless piece of cinema. In conclusion, Gold Diggers of 1933 is a must-see for any fan of classic musicals. Its catchy tunes, talented cast, and biting satire make it a true gem of the genre. Whether you're a fan of musicals or just looking for an entertaining movie to watch, this classic is sure to delight. The theater. It was the day of the big Harvard game. We all came down, a stout company. In the creation of Gold Diggers of 1933, music played a pivotal role in enhancing the narrative and emotional tone. The film's score was composed by Harry Warren, with songs written by Al Dubin. Both were prominent figures in the early Hollywood music scene. The movie's soundtrack features memorable songs like We're in the Money and Pettin in the Park, which not only advanced the plot, but also reflected the economic climate of the Great Depression. For instance, We're in the Money humorously depicts the desire for wealth during tough times. Harry Warren once mentioned, I tried to make my music reflect the story and the characters. It was never just about creating catchy tunes. This approach is evident in the film, where the music underscores the character's emotions and advances the storyline. The film's orchestrations were handled by Ray Heindorf, who would later become a renowned figure in Hollywood music. Heindorf's work added depth to the compositions, ensuring they aligned with the on-screen action. The musicians involved in the film score, including the studio orchestra, brought Warren's compositions to life. Their skillful performances added emotional resonance, making the music an integral part of the film's appeal. Even the dance sequences were meticulously choreographed to match the music, 
resulting in a seamless blend of song, dance, and storytelling. The film's iconic Shadow Waltz number, for example, features violinists with light-up instruments, creating a visually stunning spectacle synchronized with the music. In essence, the creation of the score and soundtrack for Gold Diggers of 1933 was a collaborative effort, with each element contributing to the whole. The music's ability to complement the narrative and emotional tone has ensured this classic film's enduring appeal. Come in, come in. Gigolo Eddie always shows up at the... In the early scenes of this classic, Gold Diggers of 1933, a striking image appears, 15 theater marquees conspicuously display clothes. Interestingly, these theaters were all real Broadway venues of the time, though none actually shut down entirely during the Great Depression. Some did convert briefly to motion picture showcases, remaining so for varying durations between 11 and 26 years. Out of these 15, 11 continue to operate today, seven under different monikers, while the other four have been unfortunately raised. One of the film's leading ladies, Ruby Keeler, shares an intriguing connection with fellow dancer Patsy Kelly. They crossed paths when both attended Jack Blue's Dance Academy located on West 54th Street in Manhattan, but back then, Keeler was just 11 years old. Decades later, in 2019, her contributions to tap dance earned her induction into the Distinguished International Tap Dance Hall of Fame. I just couldn't let it go out that way. We'll buy you a corsage on the way. One of the most memorable scenes in the movie Gold Diggers of 1933 is the number we're in the money. This musical sequence showcases the financial struggles faced by the characters during the Great Depression. Directed by Mervyn Leroy, the scene features chorus girls dancing with giant coins and singing about having money. The performances stand out in this scene, particularly Ginger Rogers' brief appearance where she sings and dances while covered in silver dollars. Cinematographer Sol Polito uses high contrast lighting to highlight the glittering coins, creating a visually striking image. This scene had a significant impact on audiences, reflecting the harsh realities of poverty during the Depression, while also providing a moment of escapism through music and dance. According to Leroy, people wanted something to take their minds off their troubles. We gave it to them with entertainment and spectacle. Another iconic scene occurs later in the film, when the character Brad Roberts performs Remember My Forgotten Man, accompanied by a powerful chorus line and dramatic staging. Director Leroy again excels in capturing emotion and intensity, emphasizing the song's message about forgotten war veterans struggling to survive. Cinematographer Polito enhances the emotional depth of this scene through low-key lighting and deep shadows, evoking feelings of despair and desperation. Actress Joan Blondell delivers a heartfelt performance alongside Powell, further elevating the already poignant material. According to actress Aline McMahon, who played Trixie Lorraine in the film, Remember My Forgotten Man resonated deeply with audiences because it spoke directly to the challenges they were facing during that time. She stated, it wasn't just another catchy tune, it was truth wrapped up in melody. These unforgettable scenes demonstrate how thoughtful direction, strong performances, and innovative cinematography can create lasting impressions on viewers, transcending generations, and solidifying gold diggers of 1933 as a true Hollywood classic. I got a new idea for a number and I lost all track of time. Got a piano play for you. Say, listen, kid, I'm the comedian around here. We've had enough. In the midst of rehearsals for We're in the Money, Ginger Rogers started messing around, singing in Pig Latin. When studio executive Daryl F. Zanuck overheard her, he had a brilliant idea. Why not incorporate it into the movie? And so, they did. Now, let's shift focus to another character in the film, Billy Barty. Before his acting career took off, Barty pursued a different path. He majored in journalism at L.A. City College and even served as both the sports editor and public relations director of the L.A. Collegian newspaper. Quite impressive. When Barty passed away in 2000, his funeral was held at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, located in North Hollywood, California. A fitting tribute to a man who brought joy to many through his work in entertainment. Why, well, I can't believe it. The description and I knew... Therefore, the film highlights the struggles of women during the Great Depression, offering a mix of humor and social commentary. Through catchy songs and lively dance numbers, it reflects the desire for financial security and romantic love. Audiences connected with the characters who navigated difficult times with resilience and charm. The movie also influenced pop culture by introducing memorable songs and dance styles inspiring future musicals. Additionally, it sparked discussions about gender roles, 
showcasing strong female leads who challenged traditional expectations of the time. This classic served as both entertainment and a mirror to society's evolving values, leaving a lasting impression on its viewers. Right in my... In the acting world, connections and family ties can play a significant role. For instance, Joan Blondell, known for her work in the movie Gold Diggers of 1933, received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, highlighting her contributions to the industry. Guy Kibbe, another actor in the same film, has a notable familial achievement of his own. His son, Robert, went on to become the Chancellor of the City College of New York. Lastly, Ginger Rogers, who also graced the screen in Gold Diggers of 1933, had a distant family connection to Rita Hayworth. Their relatives were connected through marriage, making them sort of cousins in the broader sense. These behind-the-scenes relationships add another layer to the already rich tapestry of classic Hollywood films like Gold Diggers of 1933. Gold Diggers of 1933 met with widespread acclaim upon its release, captivating audiences and critics alike. Morgan Hall of the New York Times praised the film for its wit and humor, stating that it was directed with verve. The review also commended the cast performances, particularly Warren William and Joan Blondell. The film proved popular among general audiences as well, becoming one of the top grossing films of the year. Its success can be attributed to the engaging storyline, memorable musical numbers, and talented performers. At the 6th Academy Awards, Gold Diggers of 1933 received a nomination for Best Picture, highlighting its significance in the cinematic landscape of the time. While it did not win in this category, the recognition speaks volumes about the impact and quality of the production. Such accolades serve as a testament to the hard work and dedication of everyone involved in creating this classic piece of cinema. For director Mervyn Leroy, screenwriter Erwin S. Jelzy, composer Harry Warren, lyricist Al Dubin, and the entire cast and crew, these nominations and positive reviews validate their efforts and cement their places in Hollywood history. In Gold Diggers of 1933, Aline McMahon made an impression before becoming a founding member of the Screen Actors Guild in late 1935. Another cast member, Ginger Rogers, experienced her breakthrough with this film. It was her 20th appearance but only Fred Astaire's second. Interestingly, although many films from this era featured horses and horsemanship, Charles Lane, who appeared in Gold Diggers of 1933, shared in a PBS interview that he never got to ride a horse in any of his roles. Despite his expertise in equestrianism and training other actors, this opportunity eluded him during his time working on this classic. For that, you're not. Trixie, come on in, Trixie. Well, I'm very much afraid. In the early stages of this classic, Gold Diggers of 1933, Ginger Rogers faced a significant challenge. She was set to dance alongside Fred Astaire in their first on-screen pairing, but suffered an injury that threatened her participation. Determined to perform, Rogers hid her pain and even sewed a patch over the hole in her stocking rather than delay shooting. Behind the scenes, tension often ran high between director Mervyn Leroy and leading lady Joan Blondell. Known for her quick wit, Blondell would frequently improvise lines, which didn't always sit well with Leroy. One day, after what must have been yet another ad-lib joke, an exasperated Leroy reportedly shouted, Will you please say the goddamn lines I wrote? To which Blondell retorted, Oh, for Christ's sake, Mervyn, lighten up. During the filming of the iconic number We're in the Money, choreographer Busby Berkeley pulled off quite a feat. He had three giant coins, each weighing around 300 pounds, spun by dancers on rotating platforms while singing about being flush with cash. This spectacle served as a striking contrast to the harsh realities of the Great Depression outside the studio walls. The memorable song Remember My Forgotten Man went through several changes before reaching its final form. Initially titled God's Country, it underwent numerous lyrical adjustments due to concerns about its controversial themes. Despite these modifications, the powerful performance still resonates today, serving as a poignant reminder of the era's hardships. So sorry. Quite all right. In Gold Diggers of 1933, Ginger Rogers shared a close bond with her mother, Lella E. Rogers, which lasted until their deaths. They are now laid to rest side by side at Oakwood Memorial Park, with Fred Astaire's grave nearby. 
Dick Powell, another actor in the film, was paired with Ruby Keeler in seven Warner Brothers productions, including 42nd Street and Dames, along with Gold Diggers of 1933. Billy Vardy, who also appeared in Gold Diggers of 1933, experienced a legal dispute in 1990 when producer William Winkler sued him in small claims court over unpaid fees for the comedy series Short Ribs. Winkler won the case, leading to widespread publicity, with stories appearing in newspapers, radio news shows, and television news stations across the country. Entertainment Tonight even covered the story, with headlines such as Small Billy Barty in Small Claims, and Barty Comes Up Short in Small Claims. Barty himself described it as the most negative publicity he had ever received in his life, comparable to the attention Zaysa Gabor received for slapping a Beverly Hills police officer around the same time. I cannot afford to waste more time in coming to an understanding with you. I've been watching. In 1933, the movie Gold Diggers of 1933 made a significant impact on the film industry. This classic introduced several innovations that would shape future filmmaking. For instance, it popularized the use of elaborate dance sequences as a key element in musical films. The groundbreaking pattern in the park number, with its social commentary and intricate choreography, set a new standard for musical movies. The film's director, Mervyn Leroy, skillfully balanced humor, drama, and music, creating a unique blend that would become a hallmark of the golden age of Hollywood musicals. The movie stars, including Ginger Rogers and Joan Blondell, also left their mark on Hollywood. Their performances helped define the genre of the gold digger film, which explores the lives of ambitious women seeking financial security and love in a world dominated by men. Gold Diggers of 1933 has inspired numerous subsequent works, including the successful Gold Diggers film series and the popular stage musical Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Its influence can also be seen in modern musicals like Chicago and Moulin Rouge, which continue to explore the themes of ambition, love, and survival in a glamorous yet unforgiving world. In summary, Gold Diggers of 1933 has left an indelible mark on film history, pushing the boundaries of musical storytelling and leaving a rich legacy for future generations of filmmakers and audiences alike. Its innovative approach to musical numbers, compelling characters, and thought-provoking themes continue to resonate and inspire, making it a timeless classic in the world of cinema. In the film Gold Diggers of 1933, Ginger Rogers, known as a distant cousin of Lucille Ball, according to Lucy Arnaz, made her appearance. Coincidentally, it was also the debut of Cynthia Lindsay. Moreover, Dennis O'Keefe, son of Edward Flanagan, graced the screen in this classic. What did you need? Five dollars. Oh, you just keep that. Buy yourself a yacht. Oh, but I get so... Billy Barty's nephew and his wife played a significant role in preserving Barty's legacy. After starting a biography project on their own, they were approached by Peter Jones Productions for assistance on an A&E &A biography about Barty. Joan Blondell, known for her role in this classic, had a fascinating personal life. She was a mother of two children, one of whom was adopted by her second husband, Dick Powell. Aline McMahon, who played the memorable character Trixie in the film, had a diverse career. Despite being best remembered for her maternal roles, she showcased her versatility in this classic as a wisecracking chorus group. Before gaining fame in Gold Diggers of 1933, Ginger Rogers had already shown her dancing skills by winning the Charleston Championship of Texas in a contest held on December 3, 1926. Another actor in the movie, Sterling Holloway, had worked with Will Rogers but encountered misfortunes during filming when a shelf filled with props fell on his head and a gun accidentally exploded in his hand. Lastly, Aline McMahon, who also starred in Gold Diggers of 1933, was related to S. Sylvan Simon through family ties as they were cousins. If I come near him again, I'll break both your legs. I could easily resent that and scram. Oh! Did little Faye cry out? Did you know that Gold Diggers of 1933 was released during the Great Depression? This classic film managed to bring laughter and joy to many people during tough times. If you have seen it, what are some of your favorite moments or songs? Maybe the catchy tune of We're in the Money, or the hilarious comedy relief provided by Ginger Rogers' character. This movie also offers a glimpse into the past, showing us fashion, social norms, and entertainment preferences of the era. Does learning about history through films like this one make it more engaging for you?
How has watching old movies influenced your appreciation for cinema's evolution over the years? We would love to hear about your personal connections to Gold Diggers of 1933. Share your stories with us and other readers. What stands out to you after all these years since its release? By liking, sharing, and subscribing, you help create a community where we can explore and enjoy classic cinema together. So don't hesitate. Tell us your thoughts.